Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, which will provide an overview of water energy saving programs that can be implemented at the local level. Next. My name is Jenny Woods, and I'm a project manager at the Local Government Commission. LGC is a nonprofit organization that fosters innovation in local environmental sustainability, economic prosperity, and social equity. Next. <clears throat> LGC helps transform communities through inspiration, practical assistance, and by creating a network of visionary local elected officials and other community leaders. Next. <clears throat> LGC has organized this webinar through our participation in a statewide energy efficiency collaborative. SEEK is an alliance to help cities and counties reduce greenhouse gas emissions and save energy. SEEK is a collaboration between three statewide nonprofit organizations and California's four investor-owned utilities. Next. Before we get started today, I just want to go over a few logistics. Everyone will be muted except the person speaking. Um, and due to the large number of participants, we ask that you type your questions or comments in the question box in your control panel. I will be summarizing any questions or comments during the Q&A portion following each speaker. We will also have a Q&A period for any remaining questions at the very end of the webinar, time permitting. Any of the questions we don't get to, we'll ask the presenters to respond to, and we'll make those responses available on our website. Presentations, resources, any questions answered after the webinar, and a recording of the webinar will be made available on LGC's website following the event today. When you log out of the webinar, you will be asked to complete a short survey. Please take a few minutes to provide us with input, which will help us improve future webinars and presentations. Choose future webinar topics and make sure that these webinars are as useful for you as possible. So as we all know, California is facing one of the most severe droughts on record. 60% of California is suffering from exceptional drought, the worst category. Next. California's 2014 water year recently ended as one of the driest on record. In 2014, it's also shaping up to be California's warmest year on record. This has left reservoir levels at historic lows, with state reservoirs only storing a third of their capacity. And a recent winter forecast from NOAA's Climate Protection Prediction Center this month shows that the California drought will likely persist or intensify in many parts of the state moving forward. Next. In response, Governor Jerry Brown declared a, straight, a drought state of emergency in January and directed state officials to take all necessary actions to prepare for water shortages. Many farmers are bracing for these shortages by leaving their fields barren or identifying innovative ways to cut back on water usage. And many municipalities are ordering mandatory conservation measures. Next. There is also a growing understanding of the inextricable link between water and energy use, both through supply and demand. This has led many governments to look towards solutions that can increase both water and energy efficiency within their jurisdiction. And today, this webinar um, will delve into this topic and showcase innovative opportunities to increase water and energy efficiency within your community. Next. So we have a packed agenda today. We have a number of, of great speakers. We'll first start out with a presentation by James Workman from Smart Markets, who will provide an overview of his organization's save and trade systems for energy and water. Jamie is an authority on natural resource conservation markets. He wrote the award-winning Heart of Dryness, How the Last Bushman Can Help Us Endure the Coming Age of Permanent Drought, and founded Smart Markets, which customizes online utility-based trading platforms, AquaJust and EnerJust, for cities to monetize water and energy savings. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie. Thank you, Jenny. Well, Leading up to that uh, uh, background, there's got to be a, a lot of uh, extra anxiety that we're all feeling about uh, climate change, about drought, about the restrictions on what kind of energy. And I want to just in the next few minutes offer some reassurance and go from you know, a state of despair to offer grounds for some rational hope uh, and, and get us out of this social tension in, into what you know, California has always been, and that's a state of grace. But right now, that's not the condition. And, in California cities, as you know, there's this shrinking water and energy, and you can almost smell the fear. 
uh, it's at three levels. At your chamber of commerce, there's a business fear of being exposed to material risks. And your family is probably feeling a social fear where if they should flush or if they should shower or, or let their lawns live or die. And for most of you in your, your business, in your, in your work, uh, there's this political fear that you might have to cut off the very source of life, of, of the lifeblood of businesses, which is, of course, energy and water. Now, to, to deal with these, we've probably all considered what I call the three Ds to increase supply, which are dams and desalination and, and deep well pumping. And of course, that, that assumes that we have the funds and the natural resources to build them. But you don't. Even uh, you know, if you build the dams, there's no telling of whether you'd be able to hold anything. And even if there's flash floods, you have to release them, the water stored, and so forth. So that that has hit a wall. So then we consider sort of the three R's, I'd call it, for reducing demand. And and these are you know the ugly word of rations. Um, uh, some cities are are imposing restrictions, uh, which you know these cities say, oh, this is what you need to do to conserve. Um, and of course, there's the, the real fallback. Uh, the economists are always saying, oh, it's very simple to deal with water scarcity. Just just raise the rates of what people pay. Now, those economists are never uh, running for public office, surprisingly enough. Um, they just want to advise those uh, to do to, to commit political suicide. Because as a reaction of the three R's, you you get this fourth R of reactions that from the public. Um, it assumes you have tolerance or the capacity uh, to mandate or enforce the three R's, and again, you don't. And so we've all hit this wall. I'm no longer the presenter, I'm afraid. Jenny, can you hear me? Yes. Um, we were never able to he see your slides, so we're going to show them on our screen. Sorry for the inconvenience, participants. We will fix this problem in just one minute. Okay, we'll go to the third slide and we'll get going. Yeah, that we're, we're just facing, you know, um, we've hit this wall. Okay, go ahead, next. So we've considered rations. Go ahead, next. We've considered these restrictions. Next. And we've considered rate hikes. And these, these become very difficult, very painful to even consider, let alone enforce. Next. Next, because of the political pushback that you get, uh, it's it's just a non-starter. So we've hit the wall, but looking ahead, as, as Jenny said, matters are only going to get worse. Um, the dry parts are going to get drier, uh, and we're even even if we didn't have the droughts, we'd be feeling stress from growing demands on energy and water. I just want to propose: what if you had the tools to calm and reverse these escalating fears? What if you could painlessly reduce the water and energy scarcity that your city's feeling and instantly climate-proof your city against these future shocks without new dams and desalination, without new rules and regulations? Next. Just the quiet incentives of an online marketplace, basically through two utility-based resource trading platforms that monetize water and energy savings. Now, AquaJust, Energest, next. And our save and trade system, I got to admit, all grew from a personal humiliation. Uh, for years, like, like many of you, I just saw resources, like energy and water, as supply to manage and allocate. That's how I understood it in college. And when I went to the Clinton administration and worked with Bruce Babbitt on the Colorado River, as author and professor and advisor to the World Bank, International Water Association, World Commission on Dams, and advising some Fortune 500 companies, uh, it all got to my head until one day, uh, as a global water expert, feeling my oats, I drove into the Kalahari, next, to rescue the poor, helpless, besieged Bushmen there, and, um, and I broke down. It was like one of those New Yorker cartoons in the desert. I realized how stupid I was, and I had a epiphany which was a very humbling experience, realized, geez, I'm bringing water uh, resources to people who've done 30,000 years of R&D out here in the desert. Next. And I realized in sort of a conversion on the road to Damascus that they didn't need my help, uh, but rather their timeless coping strategies 
could rescue our thirsty cities. And what they did was basically nothing romantic, nothing woo-woo, you know, kind of spiritual. It was a constant exchange, a system known as Daro, in which they would gather and hunt water and energy resources and then trade whatever they saved with others in the band. Now, this is important because trade led to efficiency, and efficiency revealed excess resources um, all around the place, and doing so helped them end scarcity. They never felt like they were suffering or deprived out there in the middle of this desert. Next. And so you might say, well, that's great, Jamie, for the Bushmen, but you know what? We don't live in that world uh, anymore. Um, California is an intensely urbanized civilization with centralized pipes and wires of this water G-grid that we're talking about. And so what do you propose, Jamie, that the neighbors trade car batteries or bring uh, jugs of water to next door? I say, no, you know, in our hyperlinked online age, we can convert the timeless face-to-face -face barter systems of the Bushmen, next, into this online web mobile peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. And here we'll show you just a screenshot from, from AquaGest of what the end users, whether they're businesses, families, or firms, would be seeing. Now, how does this work in practice for the next one? Basically, some would compare it to a cap and trace system, except it's voluntary, uh, it's online, and it's connected through the meters. Every 100 gallons that an end user, a metered end user, saves, or one kilowatt hour, they save below their past usage, which is set through you know historic uh, uh, analysis of. Uh, of their past energy and water use over the previous nine or ten years, earns them eco shares. An eco share is like a credit or unit of, uh, of, of earnings. Next. And it's best compared to what a lot of us think of as air miles or loyalty points that, uh, that people own. And that's theirs to decide what to do with. They can accumulate them, they can save them, they can donate them to whomever they please. Next. Most importantly, they, they can start to think about tracking and valuing them. Again, 100 gallons saved from river currents, a kilowatt hour saved, but note the, the currents on the energy grid uh, amount to an eco share. Next. And so there's trade within the water or grid uh, system to those who want more. Well, who are those who want more? Well, they're, they're yourselves. Some people just want to offset their own use uh, to show that they are giving back more water or energy to the grid than they're taking. Um, they're their neighbors that are using more, their industries, their foundations and causes. Um, there's energy producers like PG&E or Southern California Edison. And there's the public entities themselves, the governments that are using as much water as all the industries combined. Next. And we can look into this in a little bit more detail. Who's, who's really going to volunteer to pay to offset their water G use? Let's start with Chevron. Uh, Chevron, it takes 13 gallons of water to produce one gallon of gas. In the Richmond refinery alone, they're processing 3.5 million gallons of gas a day. They're looking at ways to reduce their water footprint. Now, Wells Fargo, you don't think of as a water using uh, institution, but they do. They use 3 billion gallons a year, and they're looking to reduce that 45% uh, through working within the community on their own and within the system. Starbucks, a classic beverage uh, maker, uh, their average retail store goes through 30,000 gallons a month. Now, they've tried to reduce their exposure to risks by uh, reducing water 17%. But, you know, as something that flavors water and sells it, it's hard for them to cut into their water use very much more. And, of course, the biggest user in any city is the public services, the fire uh, department, the hospitals, the gardens, the golf courses, the fountains. And these are very hard to reduce without really cutting into the muscle and sinew and bone of a function. Next. In the popular imagination, of course, the biggest users um, are these you know, bottled water companies and they're demonized, uh, you know, Nestle, Pepsi, Coke, um, that are taking water within the drought zone and reselling it for a thousand times as much. And those guys actually have talked to them and say, put a price on water, let us offset ourselves and we'll, we'll pay it. We're willing to do so. Next. I can see that, that AquaJest isn't for everyone. And Energest isn't for everyone. There's a lot of people that say, look, I, you know, I just want to accept the risk, status quo. I'm a couple years away from retirement and so forth. Um, and I admit it's a new thing. 
there are dozens of increasingly eager cities as we get down to the bone of, of, of those reservoirs and groundwater pumping uh, hitting dry. But to validate um, AquaJust and Energist, we've started in just one. Next. And that's in the Sonoma uh, County uh, along the Russian River, uh, where this winter we'll be rolling out our first demonstration partnership uh, in, in Sonoma County, working with a wholesaler, the Foundation, California Water Foundation, retail utility, Valley of the Moon, uh, NGOs in the Valley that are really supportive, and ourselves. Next. This is one part of a system that's um, uh, it, it connected to the river and to the groundwater basins, uh, and so they're they're recognizing their interdependency and curious to see you know what happens next. And it's still early; we haven't gone live yet, but we're already discovering four really powerful dynamics that I think would be of interest to you guys. Next, the first is we often talk about the the vicious cycle of the water gene nexus, but we don't know really how to address this, how to really get these you know changes and improvements system wide. Now, by being able to engage the end users, you get the bulk of the energy embedded in water. And because we're focusing on treated water, you're getting the bulk of the energy in the system as a whole. Next. We also found that while greed is a powerful driver, and we want to harness that definitely, what really firms and families compete for is rank. They want to be able to see their status, how they compare with other users on a percentage basis. Um, and be able to improve their status, uh, either by using less or offsetting their use by you know, paying others uh, who do. Next. The third big driver we discovered is that uh, there's a lot of leakage in the system, uh, known as non-revenue water, of course. And when we realize that the city itself can earn EcoShare credits for reducing these losses. Right now, it doesn't really pay to figure out where these leaks are and take steps to do so. It's a very expensive process. But if they can be rewarded for doing so, that changes the game for them. Next. And the biggest change we found is that this focus on water changes people's perceptions. It builds bottom-up support for technology installations, whether to install new meters, as you know, several hundred thousand uh, accounts still haven't done, um, and to upgrade the meters uh, into smart or AMI, AMR systems. Next. Now, our virtual platform is anchored. It sits on a solid foundation, which is a water meter. And right now, uh, the trouble is no one likes meters, old or smart, uh, energy or water, and you really can't blame them. Uh, to install some of these meters, like in Sacramento, it boils down to about $4,000 per meter, which is passed on to the end user, just to be able to collect more and more accurately what the end users owe. There's nothing in it for them, and so they naturally push back. They say, oh, we don't want this. We, you know, we weren't consulted. Uh, we're worried about the electronics in the air and so forth. But if you reverse those meter incentives, it changes things. People start to think about how much they could earn based on what they save, and then the meters work for them. When you frame it that way, people start to demand meters, smart meters, sub-meters, uh, uh, you know, electronic meters all over the place. And that's got the interest of some of these utilities uh, uh, to also work with the meter companies that are able to integrate with our system. They provide the hardware. We are agnostic. We integrate our software within their system, making the, the data they, they produce real and valuable to the end user. Next. Now, I've got this conservation approach, but to make the vision real, I've assembled a, a diverse and savvy can-do team. Uh, that is able to focus on the, the economics, the drivers, the partnerships, the gaming elements, the analytics of, of the data, uh, the product itself, uh, how we could run some auctions, how we can integrate different perspectives. Next. And I don't pretend that we're the only dashboard out there. Uh, there's plenty of alternatives, and I think some of you are probably aware of and connected to some of them. They, they count drops uh, of water. They uh, crunch the watts. Uh, they send out alerts and, and cues and information and education. They, they encourage do-good conservation by providing more data, more information, and packaging it in a really useful way. And they're able to get like a 2 to 5% blip in, in individual behavior changes, and that's fantastic. The trouble is it doesn't bring a real, lasting transformation of the system. Next. And I think to, to come.
compare the, the differences, we can look at another driver of anxiety in California, of social tension, and ask ourselves, you know, did education and information break our tobacco addiction? Unfortunately, it didn't. It wasn't until we really started to monetize non-smoking that we got the kind of results we've seen today. Next. Now, a lot of efforts follow the mantra, information wants to be free. Now, that may be true. But at the same time, water and energy want to be valued. And of course, aquagest and energest uh, want to be valued too. And so people say, well, what's in it for you guys? How do you break even? Basically, we charge, you know, uh, whatever the thousand dollars to install the meter, we charge a license fee to the utility to give meaning and value to that meter to the end user. And we earn a commission uh, of brokering transactions between end users. And next, now these grants have helped us develop and test and improve and scale up our prototype. But the cash, you know, uh, value of energy and water saved is only one measure of the value. And eco shares can go beyond a return on investment into a broader return on the environment. Next. Now people ask us, you know, Jamie, why are you taking AquaGest, uh, focusing so much energy at the municipal level and not going out into the rural areas of irrigation where 60, 70, 80 percent of the water uh, is really moving around? And it's because the cities are the nexus where meters and energy and water and carbon all converge. So we find by cutting demand for water, you reduce water's 10% emissions and the energy embedded within it. That restores more cash currency to circulate locally instead of being you know, invested in desalination company from Korea or Australia or, or Israel. Uh, the river currents stay in the stream, they're not diverted, and we reduce the demand for the electric current off the grid. Next. I would probably still doubt my original claim that AquaGest or Energest can relieve California of these scarcity tensions. And five years ago I'd have agreed it would have been impossible. But what if I told you back then about a trading platform to relieve taxi scarcity or, or hotel scarcity or relieve parking scarcity without any new laws and regulations or building a single new unit? All of this has taken place and it's really driving down the demand and increasing opportunity for people. The share economy is a really powerful force. Next. And we just want to customize that to your needs uh, of cities and put the, the reins of control back in your hands. So as smart markets can monetize water and energy savings with the cities, we can transform California's crisis of fear back into its original state of grace. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I really appreciate that. And sorry again for the technology challenges. Um, if, if individuals have questions for Jamie, please type them into the question box. And because we're running a little tight on time, we'll see if there's time at the end to answer any questions that come up. So um, for now, we're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, this is going to be a joint presentation by Jonathan Kevlis from New Renewable Funding and Barbara Spoonhauer from Western Riverside Council of Government. They are going to talk about how PACE can be utilized to finance water and water energy projects. So prior to joining Renewable Funding, Jonathan worked at AECOM as a sustainability economist at Sierra Club as lead researcher on its Beyond Coal campaign in the Clinton Climate Initiative Building Retrofit Program and at Rocky, Rocky Mountain Institute as a Sustainable Cities Fellow. Jonathan served as Deputy Mayor for Economic Development in Los Angeles and as Regional Administrator for the City's Redevelopment Agency. Jonathan received his BA from Princeton and his MBA and MA in Urban Planning from UCLA. And then we have Barbara Spoonhauer, Director of Energy and Environmental Programs. She has been with WR COG since 2001. Ms. Spoonhauer has over 10 years experience in local government and over 15 years in implementing environmental programs. Ms. Spoonhauer oversees the energy efficiency and water conservation programs for Western Riverside County, referred to as HERO. The HERO program expand, expanded statewide in 2014 and currently has over 1 billion in approved projects. In addition, Ms. Spoonhauer oversees the Western Riverside Energy Leaders Partnership which is a public-private partnership with Southern California Edison that promotes 
jurisdictional leadership for the promotion of energy efficiency. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk with you all today about PACE financing and my role in it, which is uh, through renewable funding. Uh, we are the program administrator for the California First PACE financing program. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little summary of what Barbara and I will talk about today. I'll touch briefly on what is PACE and talk about the energy-related products that are eligible for PACE financing and also water-related projects. Uh, and then I'll talk about a little sample project looking at water savings and economics. And uh, touch a little bit on, um, I'm sorry, and then uh, Barbara will take over from there and touch on her program. The next slide, please. So what is PACE? For those who don't know, it stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. Essentially, it is a quickly accessed financing mechanism for both homeowners and for commercial building owners, which can pay for a large variety of energy efficiency, renewable energy, and of course, water conservation measures. Uh, part of what's exciting about uh, PACE is that it requires no upfront cost to homeowners. Uh, repayment appears as a line item on a homeowner's property tax bills or other commercial building owners. And if a homeowner or building owner leaves uh, or sells a property prior to paying off the entirety of the assessment over time, that assessment can be transferred over to the new owner and the heir for the obligation to pay it off. And of course, that new owner inherits uh, the benefits in that property from the assessment, such as a solar system, a, a drip irrigation system, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just briefly here is a list of uh, some sample renewable energy and energy efficiency products. In the bottom there, you'll see a link that provides a, a gets you to a page from our website that provides a full list. This list is often is frequently growing as people come up with new ideas and new technologies you want to uh, have PACE financeable. And oftentimes, we conclude they are, so we add them to the list. I believe this presentation will be made available uh, after the presentation, so hopefully you can get this and click on those links at, at your leisure. So next slide, please. And here is a, a listing a little bit of some indoor and outdoor water conservation products. And I just want to touch a little bit more detail on this than I did in the previous slide, uh, just to give you an idea of some of the important um, conditions that make a product eligible for PACE financing. And this eligibility is determined by language in the state law, AB 811, that uh, created PACE programs uh, back in, I think, 2008 or 2009. So essentially, the, the key issue is that a, to be eligible for PACE financing, because PACE financing is tied to the property, to so the property tax assessment, the improvements, the products that are installed must be, quote, permanently affixed to the property. So uh, repairing leaky water delivery pipes, fresh water delivery pipes, that is eligible. Low flush toilets are eligible. But an efficient clothes washer is not because presumably if you leave the house, you could pick up the, pick up the, uh, the washing machine and um, take it with you. Therefore, it's no longer attached to the property. Similarly, with outdoor products, uh, drip irrigations are deemed permanently affixed and they save water. Lawn removal uh, is certainly eligible especially if replaced with artificial turf or some other qualified items. So, of course, uh, the plant that may be in, uh, installed as part of a lawn removal project would not be uh, eligible. They are not deemed to be permanently affixed to the property. They also do not meet a minimum product life requirement, and plants most often don't come with a warranty. So just some detail on uh, eligibility issues here on the water side. Next slide, please. So looking quickly at uh, a lawn removal uh, project, so lawn removal basics, and these are some statistics I, I gathered from uh, the city of Santa Monica that did actually a, a multi-year study of lawn removal, looking at literally homes adjacent to one another on a street in Santa Monica and their water use, one with a lawn and one that had a lawn removed. And uh, these are some of the statistics they came up with. So in general, about five bucks a square foot uh, rebates now uh, cover actually a majority of those costs, which is very nice. Uh, water agencies obviously are very interested in folks moving their lawns. And uh, moving the lawn can save upwards of 40 cents per square foot per year on a water utility bill. 
So by uh, translating all that into, if you have a thousand square foot of lawn removed, uh, that can cost you after rebate, depending on your jurisdiction, upwards of $2,000 uh, for a homeowner. Uh, but 5,000 of that, that's uh, the PACE minimum project financing size, I believe, for both the Bureau and the California First Program. Uh, so that can be financed, and then after it's financed, you can receive a rebate and use those rebate funds uh, to apply to your PACE financing assessment payment over the years or for other purposes. And our annual water savings, <coughs> excuse me, and our water bill savings up to $400 a year. So a simple payback of five years and thousands and thousands of gallons of water saved. So you see these nice before and after pictures that demonstrate that a, a lawn removal project doesn't have to leave you with a barren lawn. It's actually something quite beautiful. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. So uh, there's this uh, discussion of the energy water nexus. And I wanted to talk a bit about that. Uh, as you may all know, about 20% whoa, 20% <laughs> of water, uh, excuse me, electricity use in California is used to treat, distribute, convey water. So for every 1 million gallons of reduced water use, you save uh, a lot of energy. In Northern California, uh, more than 5 megawatt hours for every million gallons reduced. In the Southern California, it's almost three times that amount. That's because, as you can probably guess, so much of Southern California's water has to be moved from Northern California up and over the Tehachapi Mountains. And of course, moving water uphill is no easy feat, hence the much larger energy footprint or embodied energy in water uh, that goes into Southern California. Uh, next slide. Might be my last one. So as the slide is moving forward, I think it might be uh, my turn to hand it over to Barbara. Uh, but there are a number of uh, addenda at the end of these slides that I hope you have access to, which provides more detail on both of our programs. And thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I really want to go over uh, what our program has done and sort of look at the numbers for uh, energy efficiency and water conservation. As just a background, uh, the HERO program is a residential commercial PACE program. We operate under AB 811. In December of 2011, the WRCOG HERO program launched in our 18 jurisdictions. And then we took our program statewide in February of 2014, uh, California HERO launched. And we're live in 95 jurisdictions. Uh, we have 43 additional jurisdictions that will come on board uh, and go live in November. And then all of our remaining ones are looking at launching in uh, 2015. Uh, the County of San Bernardino uh, also has a HERO program that's operated over, uh, through Sandbag. Uh, so I have a couple of their numbers in here as well. Next slide. Just to let everybody know, uh, WRCOG doesn't do this program on its own. It takes a lot of partners. Uh, it's a really good public-private partnership uh, that we have going on. So we have a list of all of the people who participate in our program. Next slide. We found since the launch of our program that for about every $100,000 that's invested uh, or funded through the HERO program, the community sees back over $198,000 in energy bill savings, over 1.6 million gallons of water being saved, one new job being created, 215 tons of greenhouse gas reductions, and then they also see uh, an economic impact of $173,000 coming back into the community in direct, indirect, and induced uh, projects. Next slide. For the WRCOG region, um, to date we've uh, approved over 19,000 projects for over $732 million. We've completed over 11,000 uh, for funding $206 million on a residential side. We have completed five commercial projects for over 500,000. Next slide. For our remaining 95 jurisdictions, we've completed over 26 uh, 100 projects for $56 million and have nearly 9,000 
applications approved for over $550 million. So we have over a billion dollars in approved uh, applications to date. Uh, next slide. If you can hit it just one more time. Thank you. Uh, just to give you some of the ideas of the water projects that are coming through, when you look at our numbers overall, we have 70% uh, are energy efficiency, uh, really HVAC, windows, doors, uh, with 30% uh, solar. But we're now seeing an uptick in water projects. Uh, when we started our program, um, and then as we've seen as the year went through, in 2012 we were less than half a percent for water projects and now we're up to 3%. And really when you look at uh, what's being funded, artificial turf is taking the lead uh, with uh, toilet fixtures uh, following next, um, drip irrigation, uh, a lot of uh, working, uh, there's a big push now for zero scape lands, uh, landscaping. So we are able to find portions of that zero scape. Uh, next slide. Uh, water projects, oops, water projects on their own don't necessarily meet the threshold of the $5,000 minimum. So a lot of times they need to be combined with energy efficiency projects. Uh, so for water conservation, we funded just solely straight water projects, uh, 379 projects for over 4.6 million. Um, our energy efficiency projects, and these include San Bernardino's numbers, it's over 20, nearly 24,000 for 217 million. And when they're combined, we've done uh, 23,949 projects of funding for $222 million. Um, next slide. You also get the environmental impacts, uh, greenhouse gas reductions, uh, energy saved, utility bill savings. Um, for our projects, we're seeing 26,000 tons of CO2 reduced on an annual basis. We've installed nearly 21 um, megawatts of solar in uh, the HERO program. Uh, that's saving us 101 gigawatts. Uh, on an annual basis, and residents are, will see over $13 million in utility savings. On the water side, we have an annual water savings of over 13 million gallons of water uh, on an annual basis, and then if you take that out over the lifetime, uh, you'll see 145 million gallons being saved just from the project, the water projects that we've done so far and the lifetime water bill savings of nearly a million dollars for the residents. Next slide. And I think that's where we cut off with Jonathan and my information, and then there are additional slides that will be available. And then we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Barbara. So I've unmuted Jonathan. And um, we do have one question coming in right now that I'll, I'll ask. Also, if anyone else has questions, please type them in now, and we have a, a few minutes to answer those questions. If not, then there, there will likely be time at the end of the webinar as well. So we have one question that says, um, asking about whether artificial turf is in fact covered by HERO, and what, uh, concerns about the fact that artificial turf may be considered fairly environmentally harmful due to the stormwater effects and filtration through plastics, as well as the turf being installed in place of drought-tolerant landscaping. Uh, artificial turf is an eligible product. Uh, we worked with our water districts uh, to make sure that they were good with artificial turf going in, and they had no problems with the turf going in. Uh, I think everybody prefers the the zero scape with the native landscaping uh, look. Um, so really it's a homeowner's uh, preference. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions for Jonathan and Barbara? If so, if you could type them into the question box. If not, we'll move on to Laura and also their contact information is listed on the screen so you can follow up with them. And again, all these presentations will be made available on our website following the webinar today. So with that, I'm going to um, thank you guys again for presenting today and for sharing information about how PACE can be used to finance both 
energy and water um, retrofits. I am now going to um, mute both of you, and I'm going to turn it over to Laura Peters, who's our last speaker um, from the Department of Water Resources, and she's going to talk about their water energy grant program. Laura Peters is a civil engineer with 20 plus years of professional experience in the field of water and wastewater management. Since joining the state of California, she has developed and managed all aspects of bond-funded grant programs. Currently, she provides program support for the Department of Water Resources Division of Integrated Regional Water Management, implementing a variety of programs that distribute bond funds throughout the state. She will provide an overview, as I said, of the, their water energy grant program, which will provide funds to implement water efficiency programs or projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce water and energy use. So with that, I'm going to unmute you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. As Jenny mentioned, I'm Laura Peters, and I'm here to talk about the Water Energy Grant Program. Next slide, please. So again, here I'm, I'm here to, if you have questions or provide information, it's a very newly established program that was, is being administered by the department. Next slide. Um, the program was conceived just this past March when the drought legislation passed. It was in Senate Bill 103, Chapter 11, and it was appropriated funds out of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Funds, which is um, part of the cap-and-trade proceeds, and it gave the Department of Water Resources $20 million to establish this water energy grant program. Of the $20 million, $19 million will be going to local assistance to provide um, residential, commercial, or institutional water efficiency programs or projects. And the programs and projects must do all three. They must reduce greenhouse gas emissions, they must reduce water use, and they must reduce energy use. Next slide. And so eligible, to be eligible to apply for these funding, you have to be a local agency, a joint powers authority, or a nonprofit organization. So included in the local agencies are public utilities as defined by PUC 216 and mutual water companies. So it's a little different than standard bond funding. Next slide. The, um, anyone who applies, it, I don't think this sounds not a water-centric audience, but if you were a water-centric audience and you were an urban or agricultural water supplier, you would have to um, abide by all of the rules that you would normally be required to abide by. And same, this new legislation with the um, Delta legislation in 2009, that we're starting to try and actually get a handle on um, groundwater elevations. So if you are a potential monitoring entity under the um, CASGEM, this, the water code section, you would have to um, provide proof that you are monitoring your groundwater basin. Next slide. And this goes to Barbara's um, program. It's very, there's a lot of overlap in the program. We, we never had this program before, and so we're really trying to look for innovative projects or programs that really reduce all three, water use, energy use, and greenhouse gas emissions. Some ideas that we came up with pretty much line the um, Line up with Barbara's slides that said, you know, in residential rebate programs, landscape retrofits, irrigation retrofits, um, cash for grass. And then if you're a commercial or institutional organization, if you could do improvements in the, um, the boilers or the water, you know, water heaters or that kind of thing in the laundries and kitchens or, you know, steam systems of commercial and institutional facilities, those would all be eligible as well as leak repair. You know, if you have a pipe and you're not even getting it to your distribution system, you would be reducing the, the use in the, of the water that you're not being able to deliver. So these are just not at all inclusive, and I'm really looking for different ideas of what else could be proposed. It's, it's not a lot of money, but um, it's an opportunity to really um, branch out and, and get more dialogue between the water and the energy sector. Next slide, please. And so um, the, the part of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund language um, tasked the California Environmental Protection Agency to define disadvantaged communities. And their de de definition, it's a, it's a different definition than ours that I'll talk to in a minute. But um, So we're going to give preference if, if your, your project benefits provides benefit to a disadvantaged community, you're going to get first, first crack at the money. And in the case there's someone on the bubble, there's two, two agencies that are on the bubble, we, we're going to give um, preference to projects that are regional in nature to comply with Water Code 
1-0544. But also we're going to try and really get good data out of this program and so if, if agencies could provide system specific energy intensity and emission factors that's that's what we're looking for. We want we want real real data. We have standard tables and the California Public Utilities Commission has has some regional numbers but but we're trying to to get more um, actual data. Next slide. So the disadvantaged communities, as defined by Cal EPA, it's more based on an environmental hazard criteria where communities that are disproportionately affected by environmental pollution as well as having low income, high unemployment. So there's seven, it's, a, it's an amazing, this Cal Enviro Screen 2.0 was developed to, it's a, it's a, geo, it's a um, ArcGIS, it's a GIS based mapping tool that is on the um, OEHA, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard um, Assessment Agency under the Cali EPA umbrella. The um, website's just here. The maps are just amazing. It, it's a census level breakdown of where where these communities stand with respect to 19 different environmental and economic indicators. There's 12 environmental and 7 economic indicators. I encourage everyone just to look at this map because it's it's really quite an amazing tool. So this is a, the preference that we're going to give is to these communities. And next slide, please. This, and so I'm going to show you just a map of a screenshot of what this map looks like. And the, the red, and these are the top 20%, the highest scoring areas. It's factored out. The map now on this website shows all of the areas from 0 to 100% highest scores. But this is just the top 20. And so you can see it's, there's a lot concentrated in the Central Valley and not so much in the foothills or in Northern California. But even in Los Angeles area, you can see when we when we zoom into the Los Angeles area, there's a lot of communities that would be eligible and for this funding. And because this is targeting to disadvantaged communities, there is no um, funding match for these funds. And so that's that's a big incentive to to try and put together some proposals in your area. Next slide, please. And so we're going to be looking at again the 75% of the project benefit is where we want to go to these disadvantaged communities. So first of all, we're going to parse out when the applications come in, we're going to spread them all out, split them all up, and see which projects meet the disadvantaged community status, which would be 75% of the project percent of the project benefit would directly benefit disadvantaged communities. And then we'd look to see if you presented a cohesive and um, implementable scope, schedule, and budget that we could we could pro hopefully take right out of the application if you were successful and put it into an agreement to reduce um, administrative time to between the award and the implementation of the projects. And then we've got this attachment too. It's an Excel workbook and it's to determine the water and energy and greenhouse gas savings resulting from the project. And this workbook, it's, it's our timing, we're just ahead of everything on, on putting this together because the Air Board is still trying to determine the, the reporting requirements and Cal EPA is still trying to, has not finalized whether it's the top 20% or the top 25% that's going to be status of um, disadvantaged communities. So, and again, everyone has these workbooks, but they're all proprietary. And so we developed a, a very simple workbook with just 10 inputs that you would input and then it's all self-populating and, it, and then it would tell you what your water savings per project cost and energy savings per project cost. Those are all going to be ranked and then, um, so next slide please. And once we've taken all of the project applications apart and scored them all individually, we're going to um, put them all back together and all of the ones, priority one, are going to be Pro, uh, proposals that, that scored yes on the DAC criteria. They had the highest water savings per total project costs, highest energy savings per total, total project cost, and that their agreements they were ready to move into a, a contract. And so this is then once if we can get rid of the entire 19 million in priority one, we'll do that. If there's funding remaining, if there weren't enough projects that met all of this criteria in priority one, we'd go to priority two. And priority two, you don't have to be a disadvantaged community, but you would have to show both high water savings and high energy savings. And again, this is over the total project proposal cost. So each proposal could be one or many projects. We, we're not expecting that every single project reduce both water and energy, but the proposal is going to focus on a system and the system will have to show system savings. It's, it's, um, a system is just the, 
the benefit area, the, the, which who's going to receive the benefit of the, of the project or projects, and who's the um, overlying jurisdiction, and where do the projects lie in res with respect to the system. Next slide, please. So again, I mentioned there's $19 million available. Each applicant, each application, which is a system-based application, will, can receive up to $2.5 million of grant funding. And if an applicant has a large system and they have two separate benefit areas that are not contiguous, meaning that have different needs or different requirements where, where water and energy savings could be realized, it's a $5 million cap per applicant. And so we want to put at least 50% of this funding, our, our target is to, to uh, allocate 50% of this grant funding to projects that do benefit um, the top 20% disadvantaged community, top 20 or 25, depending on Cal EPA's dis determination, 50% for those communities. So again, one application per system, but applicants can submit multiple applications. And again, there's no funding match required. Next slide. So we've just started doing um, public workshops, applicant assistant workshops, and we just had the first one yesterday. It was the only one that was going to be webcast, and we have one tomorrow. We're going down to Riverside, and on November 5th, we'll be in Fresno. And all of this information is on our website, but we're, we're there. We've, we've got staff, and we're going to be providing any assistance. Come with all your questions, and it's really an opportunity for um, potential grantees to come and learn about the program. The applications will be due, so the application period is open right now, and so the applications are due on December 12th at 5 p.m. We hope to have them all reviewed and um, have draft awards in early March, with final awards being announced in the April to May at the latest time frame, so we can hopefully start getting these projects underway by next summer. Next slide. So the, the, what, you would, the, what applicants would need to submit would be eligibility requirements to show that they do have authority to enter into res, uh, contracts with the state and that they can, um, they, that they, uh, yeah, they have to be able to enter uh, contracts. And then they also have to present the water and energy savings and their estimates. They have to submit the work plan schedule and budget and then show us that they do indeed benefit a disadvantaged community. Next slide. And that's, and that's my presentation. If anyone has any questions, this is the website. Uh, all of the information is on this website. This is where we are posting updates. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Laura, for, for providing that overview. We do have a couple questions that have come in. And in the meantime, if anyone else has questions, please feel free to type them in now. If you have questions for Laura or for Barbara or Jonathan or Jamie, type all those in now. We have a few minutes left for questions. So the first question is, will the grant program receive a similar allocation of you know, 19, 20 million in the next budget cycle? The, I'm sorry, say that one more time? Will the grant program receive a similar allocation of 19 million in the next budget cycle? That's a good question. This is really, I think this is really a test case to see if this is the first time that we've gotten any funding, that the water sector has gotten any funding out of this cap and trade. So I think it's really going to be based on how this works out. I've heard some some rumors that perhaps if it's if it's successful, it could be on a reoccurring baseline thing uh, schedule. But as of this, as of my knowing right now, I do not know whether they're going to on go. It's going to be going on. Okay, thank you. And then we have another question asking you to define what you mean by a system of, of the fact that you can only have one application per system. Okay, I define, we define a system as the collection of projects or programs, related infrastructure, accompanying jurisdictions, and benefit area. So you, you have an area, or like say a water service, water district service area that you know is in a disadvantaged community. You focus on that service area and that would be your system and you would see what kind of programs or projects would best benefit that system to reduce water and energy use. It's kind of a place-based program if that makes sense. And I'm guessing that uh, definition is also available in the grant guidelines. I'm reading it directly from the guidelines, yes. Is there a page where they could find that? Yes, it's on page um, six. Great, thank you. And then another question is, uh, could grant funds reward end users in disadvantaged communities directly? So in other words, if they save 100 gallons, could they be rewarded for that or only discount appliances they install? 
Yeah, we don't reward for showing proof that, oh, here we've saved 100 gallons, can we be compensated for that? It's actually, we prefer direct install of irrigation fixes or toilet replacements or, you know, that kind of thing. We we don't, it's not a uh, action-based, if that makes sense, but we, that's, no, we don't do it save for 100. They proved to us a seven, saved 100 dollars gallons of water, we would not reward them for that. Great, thank you. In the last minute or so, please feel free to type in any other questions. If not, I'll kind of do some closing remarks. So all of our presenters' emails are on the screen right now, so feel free to contact them with any further questions that you may have. I think all of them are willing and able to answer questions. Uh, and I just wanted to thank all the speakers again who took the time to speak on this webinar today. And thanks to all of you who tuned in to learn more about this topic, and we hope you found it useful. And please remember that all the PowerPoints and a recording of this webinar will be made available on our website in the next one to two days, perhaps even later this afternoon. And please remember to take a few minutes to fill out the survey once we close down the webinar today. So that concludes our webinar. Thank you for joining us.